Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to my other living room. So I've been uh, really enjoying filming outside lately, but I can't film outside today because it's a little bit cold and it's very windy. So I shifted around some stuff in my living room. Do we like the vibe? Do we like the vibe? We're gonna roll with the vibe, I guess. So um, I'm excited that you're back and I'm really excited that you guys have seemingly liked my last two videos so much because I mentioned this in those videos and I am gonna jump right in because I am practicing like getting to the point quicker. Um, but I really like that these are just easier to film. You guys know, or you, I mean, I think you know if you follow me, I spend a lot of my day like listening to sermons and audiobooks and uh, lectures and podcasts and all of that. So I spend a lot of time like absorbing information. And so this is just really fun for me. It always has been from the beginning of my channel. I've always kind of done a hybrid of like, lifestyle content mixed with running my mouth. So I'm back here today to run my mouth. Don't mind me with my fancy lapel mic barely hanging on by a thread. And my hair is something other than braids because uh, you'll be seeing my hair just in more stuff than braids. Someone actually asked that in one of these questions. Let's see, let's start off with that. Let's start off with a really basic question before I head into like the heavy hitting questions. Someone said, um, are braids the only thing you do to your hair? You don't do ponytails or hair buns anymore. Just curious. And the answer to that is most of the time, yes, braids is pr they're pretty much the main thing I do to my hair for a lot of reasons. Whoa. Okay. I thought that was like an animal crossing over our fence. In fact, it's just a really weird uh, bush. Anyways, yes, braids are like the go-to thing for me because you can keep them in for days. Uh, it keeps your hair nice and in place. And for me, it doesn't like tear at my hair or damage it. Um, I can swim in braids. Obviously now I have a new baby. And so I'm back to that like very beginning phase of like, you know, where babies just love pulling at your hair nonstop. I'm back at that phase again. So right now I have my hair down because I felt a little self-conscious like I should mix it up and not just do braids and also I haven't styled my hair in like forever that's the other thing though is I haven't gotten my hair done in like a year and a half maybe which is like the longest streak I've ever gone without like touching my hair like I've been trimming my own hair at home but I haven't been to a salon to get it like colored or properly cut yeah honestly we might even be going close to like two years at this point I'm not sure but um yeah so now that we started with a nice soft hitting question i'm going to segue into a little bit more of a difficult question um or just like more more to it than just how i style my hair so this by the way all of these questions came from instagram that does tend to be where i ask a lot of my like uh, or I take a lot of my questions for these kinds of videos and topics. Um, so if you want to follow me on Instagram, I will have that link down below. It's just my name at Nikki Philippi. And this question actually came in before I even put the box up for like, send me your questions. And this girl was like, I want you to, you know, the question that I sent to you in the DMs. And I was like, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. And this is what it says. Uh, I've been really struggling with this lately. How do you avoid playing into the us versus them mindset when it comes to current events, political views, lifestyle choices, etc.? Especially in these recent years, it's so hard to have a Christian lens embracing people with no judgment when their beliefs and choices completely do not align to my own and my own convictions. Specifically when it comes to anything COVID related, gender quote unquote fluidity, abortion, the left versus the right, gun laws, just to name a few. So um, as usual, I have like a few different thoughts around this. So first off, I think there's kind of two different issues at play here, because if there's one thing that I have learned in my life while being on the internet, and particularly since our like full-blown cancellation, but I learned this before that. That was just like the ultimate, like, wow, God's really taking me to the next level of understanding this concept. And that concept is that your intentions and the way that you see people doesn't really matter for anyone but yourself and how you know that the Lord sees you. And what I mean by that, although maybe that's really self-explanatory, is I, I don't mean it necessarily from a, because here's how I think 
people who fall more on the left side of the spectrum, like leftists, see that as like, it doesn't matter if you didn't mean to do something. If you did something and someone else translates it that way, then you are guilty of that and you need to apologize. That's not what I mean by that. What I mean by that is I've realized that you can have a very specific intention, a good intention, or not see someone in a judgmental way, or do something for like what you would deem to be a good reason. Even looking back, you're like, no, I know why I did that. And people can choose to translate that as still not being loving or as being judgmental, even if you're genuinely not judging them. And so it, it still matters, I think, how you see people and what your heart stance is towards someone, because ultimately not only do you have to get up every day and look yourself in the mirror and you want to be comfortable and I don't want to say proud, but like, yeah, comfortable with the person that you are, but also more importantly, you are standing before the Lord, like your heart before the Lord is what's important. And people are going to see and twist things how they're going to see and twist things. And part of the problem with that more, what I deem to be leftist viewpoint of like, well, I think that what you said was sexist, racist, homophobic, whatever. And you just have to be like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Is that in my worldview, I'm like, I'm like, you must not be exposed to enough people because if you get enough people in a room, so like someone can be offended at anything. And so there is a never ending train of ways that people can choose to be offended by you and your beliefs. Now, obviously, like you said, um, I think especially now in this day and age, living in a world that is definitely like the mainstream, especially in the West, is a secular worldview that they do not believe in God. It's atheistic or agnostic at the best. Um, so it especially heightens this kind of the differences in how we perceive things and what they perceive as hate. You know, the other day I saw a clip of, uh, what's his name? Governor Wallace, the, Tim Waltz, Tim Waltz, the guy that's uh, running as the VP with Kamala Harris. Can someone please tell me if it's Kamala or Kamala? I'm very confused. I don't even know how you would tell me that in the comments because I can't hear you. Uh, anyways, she's running with, he's running with Kamala. And he basically said, he was kind of making an argument against the First Amendment, against free speech, because he was like, look, I'm going to push back on that. There is no guarantee for free speech if someone is spewing hate speech or misinformation. And what I ended up, I reposted that on Instagram. And what I said was, who is deeming what hate speech is and what misinformation is? And in the little blurb, I wrote, oh yeah, that's right. The government, the crony capitalist funded universities. Um, I don't even remember what else I wrote, but basically the lobbyists, the people that are yeah, lobbying for these massive corporations. Um, that's kind of a side note. It's very fascinating how the concept of the free market, which I fully believe in, has been twisted and there's still some people I feel like on the right side of the political spectrum that haven't like caught on to this yet that big business is not just big business because like oh they did it the best and they won and I feel like that's very much the lens that I was kind of uh, raised under or the way I saw the world for a long time it's like well they did it the best and that's why they're a big business I don't believe that now I think that there is I call it crony capitalism and they basically hold hands with the government with the universities and they use that with the police, with the medical establishment, uh, with the military, and they will use those establishments to enact their values, whether it's just literally like worldview values or more importantly, it serves them, it keeps their business growing, it keeps uh, the machine just moving forward. But on that, on that note, or that same thought, one of the first things I thought, like I said, who's deeming what hate speech is and what misinformation is? And I think it's pretty obvious if you think it through that that's like half a step away from like religion falling into that category because it's very easy since a lot of religion can't really be proven. There is an element of faith there. Yes, there is factual evidence. I went to Israel like four years ago, I think, and we got to see face to face that there is like archaeological historical evidence of not only Jesus, but just the faith in general and, you know, the manuscripts of the Bible and whatever. There is literal evidence, but there is also an element of like faith there, a big element of faith. And so who's to say that that's not misinformation? And because there is specific dogma that exists within each religion, something that makes a religion have boundaries, that makes it that religion, who's to say that that dogma, that those boundaries 
are not hateful if your worldview is that you don't believe that there is a God, that you don't believe that um, the sexual ethics that a certain faith has laid forward is right. You know, like in the Christian worldview, the traditional Christian worldview, these sexual ethics are between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. And so if you don't agree with that, I mean, you're like half a step away from seeing that as hateful. So I say all of that to say there is a part of this situation here where I think there's just a level of acceptance of realizing like, okay, ultimately what I'm choosing to believe, there is a level of faith here. I don't know. We're all going to meet our maker one day. That's what I believe. You're going to have to answer to the Lord. That's what I think. But I don't really know that I'm right. So there really is no reason aside from the fact that I believe it's biblical for us to not harshly judge and look down on someone, which I do think on a side note is different than sharing with someone what you believe to be the truth is, but to not look down on someone I believe is biblical. Um, I don't necessarily believe in this concept of like sin is sin is sin, like all sin is the same, but I do believe in the concept that we are all sinners and we all have our own struggles with sin. And so to look down on someone and see it's like, ugh, I think is wrong. I think that we are called to see, and some of us I think have this strength a little more naturally than others, but I think we are called to see the face of the maker in every human because I believe every human is imprinted with the face and the essence of God. Every human has beauty within them. I think I've mentioned this before, but I took from like a really bougie acting teacher. I took classes from him back when I lived in Los Angeles and I was like late teens, early twenties. Um, and he was like, like bougie, meaning like he graduated from Yale and Yale had to pick one student from all of their schools, like their law school, their whatever, all the different <laughs> things that they have. And they picked my acting teacher as being like the valedictorian, like the person that gave this big speech and whatever. So he was like very serious about his craft. Um, I say that whatever, just to, I don't even know why I say that. I'm just painting the picture. And one of the things that we did in class one day is he had us watch a documentary of inmates that were on death row and they would go over the crimes that they committed and then they would interview them and then they would interview their family members. And there were multiple reasons he had us watch this. It was layered there really around the concept of like playing a villain. But one of the things that we talked about and that I took away from that was that everyone has something good to them. Everyone has a beautiful side to them, that there were these people on death row who had committed horrible crimes, horrible atrocities, and then their, but yet their family members still had like lovely things to say about them. Now that didn't cancel out the horrifying things that they had done, but they were not just these horrible people. And I think honestly, that is part of what's heartbreaking about people choosing to make these decisions that I believe, that we believe are not only sinful, but that they hurt them, that they're going to hurt themselves in the long run, if not the short term, is because I, I see the beauty in them. Like I, I actually had a friend the other day text me and she was like, oh my gosh, you're totally that whatever. She was being sarcastic. But she's like, you're like the hot theater kid. I've got you pegged. And I was like, man, I mean, thanks. <laughs> but like, I loved theater kids like that. Those people were my people, except that they, a lot of them were leftists that ended up hating me. You know what I mean? Because we have different ethics, but like, I loved them and I truly see fantastic things within all of them and within most people that I meet. Side note, that is something that I feel like um, it's been hard, but I do feel like that is a gift that God has given me that like I do tend to see the good in people first and I tend to just like people. Um, but so I'm kind of just trying to transmit this energy of like, I think that is a good thing to see the good in people. And it's okay that you disagree. You can disagree with people without hating them. You know what I mean? You can think that something is not a good decision without othering like, ugh, like and hating them. But that doesn't mean that they won't see you as being hateful. Does that make sense? I feel like they're almost different things. And you have to almost become comfortable with the idea of like, dude, Jesus said it. Like they hated me first. They're going to hate you. And you know, that's side note. I have like a problem with whenever pastors give sermons and they're like, come on church. Basically like you're not being good enough because you're giving Christians a bad name. And so many people say they won't go to church because Christians have done something wrong to them. And this and that. I'm like, look, I'm not saying that we haven't people like as a congregation or whoever haven't done wrong 
horrible to people and done bad things to people because once again, we are all sinners. But in my opinion, if you look at a lot of statistics across the US at least, in terms of people groups that tend to foster and adopt and give to charity, a lot of them are Christians. And that's not to say like, you know, we're so awesome, but I think there is this element that exists, whether they realize it or not, it's just my opinion of what Jesus said that like they hated him and he was perfect. So like, why did they hate him? They hated him for what he stood for, for the message he was bringing. And so to me, it only makes sense that they're gonna hate us too. And that hurts. It hurts not only because no one wants to be hated, but it hurts because there's a lot of people that like I could hang with and I could like, but they don't like what I deem to be truth, the way that I see the world. And so, they may not want to associate with me. Now, I have to say the obvious like elephant in the room on the flip side, I moved to like an enclave in the country where there are a lot of Christians. I do not live in a progressive town anymore. And a chunk of that was how I wanted to raise my children, um, the type of environment I wanted them around as we were growing up. I mean, a lot of that also has to do with the size and, um, you know, my family, but that's kind of a separate side note. But in terms of like the ethics of the town and the community, like, yes, I moved to an area where there are a lot more like-minded people because I want to protect my children as they're growing up. We've talked about this a little bit before too, that, um, you know, a lot of people will criticize homeschooling as if like you're sheltering them. And I don't think that that's bad. Like, I'm not going to shelter my children from the fact that there are people out there that believe very different things than us. And as they get older and and conversations are age appropriate, we will expose them to those beliefs. But I don't want to send them off somewhere with people who are teaching them that those views are the truth. and I don't deem it to be necessarily super safe. And the thing about the sheltering concept, I've said this before as well, but like if you're growing a plant and it's a seedling, when it's a little seedling, you have to protect that seedling. If you stick it outside too early sometimes and you try to transplant it, it won't necessarily do well. It could be killed by the intense sun or the intense wind or the intense rain. But on the flip side, and I do feel like I'm repeating myself because I feel like I've said this many times on my channel, but for those of you that haven't heard it, I'm just going to finish the thought because I'm already on the train. Um, But on the flip side, if plants are not exposed to the elements when they're mature, that will also kill them. There was this experiment done, I don't remember where in the US, I wanna say somewhere crazy like Arizona, like somewhere deserty, where they essentially built a dome and they tried to replicate, like make it's like a whole ecological environment, like a whole system. I can't find the words, you get what I mean? Like a jungle, like a plant. (laughs) I'm not finding the words. Um, Its own environment, right? Within this dome with like trees and plants and all this stuff. And for the first like seven years or something like that, it was thriving and it was doing so well. And then all of a sudden, and I find that really interesting too, that it happened like suddenly just in the concept of like cell turnover and stuff like that, um, the trees just fell. And it turned out that like, these plants not being exposed to the natural elements, to the wind and the rain and the bugs and all the things that come with being out in the wild made it so that the plant's roots did not grow deep enough. So as the trees grew tall, they did not have the root system to even support their height. So I do believe in exposing children to things, um, but early on, not so much. Uh, Kids are clearly ready for certain things at a certain time in all kinds of ways. Um, So I say all of that to say (laughs) it's tricky and I don't have the answer. And I just wanted to, I guess, give my thoughts back to you that like, yes, you want to see people on the other side of the fence. If that's the way we're going to word it, I almost don't like the phrase on the other side of the fence, the other side of the belief spectrum or political spectrum or whatever. You want to see them for the made in the image of God person that they are, because every life is a miracle and God ordained for them to be here. It's kind of like total subject change, but not really. Actually, it's not a total subject change. It's related. Um, Kind of like if people ever call a baby ugly or like, oh, that's not a good looking baby. I kind of get really annoyed because I think you are you are insulting God by calling that baby ugly because God knit that baby together in that mother's womb and ordained for that child to be here. And for you to call that baby ugly or not see the beauty that exists within that baby literally does feel like a smack in the face to God. And in some ways, 
I think it's like that if you can't find the good that exists within your fellow human. Does that mean you have to agree with them? No. Does that mean you have to stay quiet about what you deem to be the truth? No. Does that mean you have to say the truth in anger? No. But does that mean that some people still might take it as anger or hate? Yes. Um, because once again, Jesus said, they hate me first. They hated me first. They're going to hate you. Um, so, wow, that was a long spiel. This practically could have been its own video in and of itself. And in fact, now I'm like, do I make it its own video? I don't know. No, I'm going to keep answering questions. But that felt like a uh, that felt like a hefty question that needed to be kind of expounded upon. Someone said, can you do a poll of who is voting for Harris? who is voting for Trump and who is not voting. So it's not really so much a poll, but if you feel comfortable leaving a comment down below, I would be curious to know who you're voting for. And if you want to, uh, once again, expound upon that and explain why, feel free to go for it. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. Okay, on that note, someone said, thoughts on RFK and Trump teeny teaming up, especially surrounding food safety. Okay, so I am very stoked. I posted something on X, which I'm also back on X if you want to follow me there. I'm also on TikTok now. If you want to follow me on TikTok, I'm over there as well. Um, that's kind of a whole separate topic, but I am. And I posted something on X that got people real mad at me. And I basically said that I went from being a reluctant Trump supporter to practically wanting my own MAGA hat when he brought RFK on the ticket. I told you guys, I think like not my last one, but my one before that, that I wish in an alternate reality I could vote for RFK, but I couldn't because he was pro-abortion basically all the way up till birth. Now, I wouldn't say that Trump's stance on abortion is super great either. I've said this before. I think it's sad at the thought of bringing it back to the States just because I think it is so morally wrong abortion. But um, I get why he's doing that or why he wants to do that, you know, and RFK is just in general a lefty. And so there's a lot of things that I don't agree with him on abortion, obviously being a top of the list. Also, he has said some pretty intense things regarding like environmental um, activism and how he thinks that like environmental stuff should be enforced around the world. But I think that the issue of big pharma, big food and big ag is so big, for lack of another word. Um, I think it is so much more, I'm going to take a sip of water, um, so much more serious than a lot of people even understand that that is why I was like electrified and filled with excitement when he came onto the ticket. Because I did, I felt like RFK was going to split the vote because he has been such an advocate for vaccine injuries and bringing light to that, that I know that a lot of moms like me who get it, that that is a serious issue. The fact that vaccine manufacturers are not liable for injuries. Um, I mean, dude, I just got chills. It's such a serious issue that I was like, dude, he's going to split the vote. Like, I don't, I couldn't bring myself to vote for him, but I wished I could just because of his advocacy work around vaccine injuries. But I don't think it's just that, although that is the top of the list, the vaccine injury thing. Real, not necessarily even rare in my opinion. But he's also woke, in my opinion, to big food and to the harms that have come with industrializing our food system. I mean, it's really crazy when you think about it. There was this interview I watched with Joel Salatin on Alex Clark's channel. And um, he was talking about how when he decided that he wanted to get into farming, he's like, I can't even tell you how many people told me that I was throwing away so much potential by getting into farming. And he's like, dude, it's the exact opposite. Really smart people should be entering into the agriculture world. And on a side note, that's not a side note. What is also sad with that and which are about that and what is also good in my opinion about RFK stepping up and getting more of a spotlight on himself and if Trump gets in hopefully you know sliding in there with Trump whether he's leading a task force or whatever Joel basically said that you know if someone was to go to school to be a farmer like at a university and they want to go for agriculture this is what I mean guys about crony capitalism and the government and like they're all holding hands when you go to a graduation, he was claiming, I haven't been to an, a graduation for an agriculture school. So, you know, I'm, this is all hearsay, but assuming he's telling the truth, he's like, you'll see everywhere just banners for like Monsanto. I can't even think of anyone else. So now I feel dumb, but basically uh, the pesticide companies, these like modern farming 
harsh chemicals that I believe are essentially killing and ruining our land and killing and ruining us, ruining us as a population, um, that they're like the sponsor, that they give so much money to these schools, which is not surprising. And when he said it, it totally made sense because it's the same thing with like medical school, that a lot of these big pharmaceutical companies are funding a lot of programs within universities. You know, we've all heard this before, I think, that like when a doctor goes to school, they get some insanely no, low number. It's something like 20 hours or something crazy like that of actual nutritional education. Um, and if they're, you know, when they're getting the nutritional education, I wanna be like, okay, so are we sure there is no money in this class from like Coca-Cola or PepsiCo? <laughs> or anything like that, because it seems like all of the money is just muddled in with the educational system. And that's what's so wild to me too, is people's like trust in systems when business, big business, and essentially then turns into government, they're all so intertwined. Um, so anyways, yes, RFK, uh, joining hands, endorsing Trump is very, very exciting to me for that issue. Um, you know, I'm not like a one issue voter, although if there is a top of the list issue to me, it is someone's stance on abortion because I care about how they see life. And, you know, people in the comment section of my first video, by the way, were all commenting like, what do you think would happen if abortions were outlawed? Like, look at how the foster care system is already overflowing with children. Side note, that to me is almost a completely separate issue. A, it doesn't make it right, in my opinion, to murder someone because the system is overflowing. B, I think the system needs a makeover. I don't actually think that the foster care system is super great. Uh, I've talked about this briefly, though I've never gone into depth like with the story or gone into detail with the story, but Dan and I getting up close with the foster care system when we were originally going down the path for our adoption journey all those years ago um, only deepened in me a belief that there's actually a lot of uh, corruption that exists within not only the foster care system, but adoption in general in the States. Um, I think there's a lot of human trafficking that exists. And um, I think there's a lot of medical kidnapping that exists. So there is a potential that our system is also overflowing because of corruption that needs to be addressed, whether it is drug corruption, we go back to big pharma needing to be held accountable. What is going on with the fentanyl situation in this country? What is going on with our borders and the amount of not only people that seem to be able to be trafficked through the borders, according to people that work at the borders, but also with the drug situation at the borders. So I think that is a big contributor to that. And also medical kidnapping, dude, if you start paying attention to what has been going on around the US to parents that do not comply with uh, the medical agenda that a doctor deems necessary for a child, whether they have cancer or something much simpler than that, like they're not gaining weight fast enough. I mean, we had a crazy story take place down in Boise where a child was literally ripped from his mother by CPS through law enforcement, who that is wild to me that a doctor can just be like, yep, nope, take the child. And the police officer doesn't have to like go into depth as to whether they think that this is right or wrong. I'm not finding the right words, but you get what I mean. It's just taking orders directly from the doctor. That child was ripped away from its mom. The mom's milk supply dried up. The child lost even more weight because it was away from its mom. It didn't have breast milk. Um, it was crazy because they ended up being proven like false allegations, which great, they got their kid back, but you can't take back time. You can't take back the trauma that was inflicted on not only the mom having her baby ripped away from her, but the baby being ripped away from their mom. You can't take back that time and like I said the milk supply drying up and she couldn't even find where her baby was and not only were those allegations proven wrong so all of that for nothing but on top of that it looks extra fishy because it turns out that the girl's dad is like a political opponent for people that are in power in office down in Boise so it was super messed up there's a lot to that story but in my opinion when you start going down that wormhole and looking across the US it is happening fairly frequently. And so situations like that, which like I said, thank God they were proven wrong. That child was not permanently in the foster care system or within the hands of the hospital. Um, the child I think was in a home though as well during that two week period, uh, but stuff like that happens. So to me, it's almost like giving an answer that is morally wrong in my worldview, abortion being morally wrong, but then trying 
to just solve the problem, like I said, with murder versus going, wait, 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 wait. We need to look at this system that is overflowing with children and we need to ask why. Why is it overflowing with children? And like I said, I think there's a lot of layers to that, obviously, right? A lot of layers, obviously. Uh, so yeah, back to RFK. Uh, I'm not a one issue voter, but if there are issues that are at the top of my mind or the top of my list of importance, um, yeah, the vaccine thing and the public health thing, big pharma, big food, big ag is at the top of the list because I think that they have decimated our country in ways that I think most people don't understand. Or they kind of think it's an issue, but they don't realize that, like, no, it's a serious issue. Um, I think that the the chemtrails we're all seeing show up in our skies. I think that's going to become a serious issue here in the next couple of years in terms of like people talking about it because I think that's a problem as well. Just kind of wild. And it's wild to me that so many people call RFK an anti-vaxxer. Like he's not an anti-vaxxer. I'm an anti-vaxxer, especially since I found out that, oh, aborted fetal cells are like in all of the vaccines, which that's something else people in the comments were like, they're not aborted. They could have been from miscarriages doesn't matter to me. First off, I'm pretty sure they are aborted. I'll link that video again down below. It's like a, a cartoon, but they explain things that you can go fact check for yourself. So I'll link that down below. It's heartbreaking. But even if they're not aborted, miss me with that because I don't want another person's DNA injected in my body. We have so much going on with people's health that seems to be new issues in regards to like turbo cancer, even in regards to the amount of people that feel that they are the wrong gender. And I think that's a lot of things, you know, uh, spiritual, sociological, but I also think it's environmental, not only with all of the endocrine disruptors that are surrounding all of us, like all the time, even if you're trying to avoid them, but also I don't know, sounds a little sketch to be getting injections that, by the way, have never been tested in conjunction with each other. It's never happened. And according to people, like I'm pretty sure Fauci said this, Dr. Fauci, that there will never even be those tests of like how these vaccines interact with each other and they're full of human DNA. It's like, I don't know, could that be messing with people? I'm inclined to think that it is. And the fact that they're stating that those tests will never happen is something that people need to know. It is absolutely outrageous to me that a doctor can look at you and say, introduce food slowly, one food at a time, because they might have a bad reaction, but then we're supposed to go to the doctors and do three different shots at the same time on my baby. Like, and if you question that, you're a crazy mom, which lands me back at RFK. What I appreciate about him is that it is someone else raising the spotlight and taking the heat that is not just a crazy mom. I've talked about this before endlessly. It is amazing to me how in general, people on the left side of the spectrum have kind of this like motto of like, believe all women in regards to sexual assault, but we are suddenly not supposed to believe women once they become moms. And if they say something happened to my child, they are not the same. Suddenly, I mean, I just got chills. Then we don't believe them suddenly they're crazy because now they're a mom. I mean, it is, it is mind blowing to me. And to say that the science is settled when the science has never even been executed, like I said, on seeing what these shots are like together is just not only shocking to me, but mostly shocking because you're crazy if you question that. And so all that to say, RFK isn't even an anti-vaxxer. He is just a proponent of more testing, a proponent of not forcing people to take these vaccines, and a proponent of just safe science and, and believing and looking more into these people that have been injured from, he believes, vaccines. And I believe that as well. Um, so yeah, holy moly, I feel like I am just on rant mode today, but I guess... This is a Q&A, so next question. Hey, so this is Editing Nikki hopping in with a quick word from today's sponsor. I've slowly developed a little Honeymark Swim Romper collection because I am so obsessed with these. They're comfortable, they're cute, they have pockets. This fabric is like some kind of magic fabric because it doesn't sag, it holds its shape, which is saying a lot for a more full coverage bathing suit. Maybe this is obvious, but they're super easy to like chase around little kids in without flashing everyone. So they're great for family events. They're great for church camps. You can make a quick trip to the grocery store and it's no big deal. It also dries like crazy fast, almost like magically fast. They have extra support built in and you 
never have to do like the awkward, potentially awkward undressing moment. You just show up and you're ready to swim. You can use my code Nikki10 for 10% off your purchase and thank you in advance if you do. Can't recommend my Honey Mark swim romper enough. Ooh, we'll go, we'll go light here, okay? Where would you want to go for your first international family vacation with kids? Ooh, okay. That's hard. I think it would be really fun. I'm not going to answer just one. I'm going to give you a few. I think it'd be really fun to go to like Greece. When I went to Israel, I got to swim in the Mediterranean Ocean and I was like, yo, this ocean is what's up. Like it was so beautiful. I think going to Greece would be really awesome. I think it'd be really awesome to go to Italy. Oh, I would love to go to Italy. My family has actually talked about that, that if it was feasible for us, we think it would be so cool as a family to rent out like a like a villa, like an Airbnb in Italy for like a month and just to be able to travel around. Because, you know, once you get to Europe, it's like totally different, obviously, than being in the States. You can just travel from country to country and uh, have a much easier time doing so than even going from state to state here in the U.S. because of the size. So I think going around Europe would be really cool. And I think going to like Switzerland, Sweden, Norway. Um, that's part of my ethnic heritage. I'm, I mean, I'm a lot of European things. I'm like German, English, French, Norwegian, but I think going over to like that area would be really cool as well because it just looks so beautiful. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not exactly biting at the bit to travel. I'm not going to lie. Uh, kind of the state of airplanes has been sketching me out a little bit lately also traveling with kids just sounds really hard i know that those videos go around where they're like if your kid's gonna be tired and whatever it's better to be doing it you know in a fun place than at home but i watch them and i'm like i think that's only like half true because i really like my creature comforts that i can also utilize to care for my kids at home too so if and when we travel again, it's going to be a while. I think that my kids need to be older. Um, also, I feel like when you travel, you were like destined to get sick. And so it's always like, all right, here we go. Time to catch some kind of funky illness. Um, and I think I need to be done having children too. Like, and I don't know if I am. We've talked about that. So I don't foresee us really traveling much over the next couple of years, to be honest. But that's what I think of. So for now, I just can watch some Rick Steves videos and live through other people's trips. Okay, someone asked, what's next on the homesteading journey? Okay, so I can't say this is next because it will only be next by the grace of God. We have to have the time and the financial capabilities to do this. But what we're dreaming for for next spring is a couple of things. A, we want to get more chickens uh, because our chickens have kind of slowed down and they're laying a bit. And also we lost a couple of chickens. It's a whole thing. I don't want to go off into the whole story. Obviously, it's typical on a homestead to lose animals. One chicken just died and three of them were actually like attacked by raccoons. And we have like a pretty, like Dan did a really good job with our chicken coop, but things happen and that's what happened. So our flock is smaller. Um, so we want more chickens. And really what the big thing is, I'm looking over here because we have picked the spot that we want to build our garden. We didn't really garden this year. Like we have some blackberries growing, like a couple, and I'm hoping that that will grow a lot next year. Um, but and we planted a cherry tree last year that totally is dead and like not thriving at all. But we have a part next to our house that we want to fence off, including around our patio. Um, that And that's what it is basically. Wow, that's the short version. We wanna build this garden and I want like twinkle lights going overhead right off of our kitchen. And we want our patio fenced off as well because even though our chickens have a chicken run on the side of the house, we frequently let them free range our whole yard because they have eaten the grass completely dry in the chicken run. And fresh living blades of grass are very good for the chickens and increase the nutritional quality of their eggs. So we like letting them free range, but we wanna fence off our patio and our garden so they don't eat the stuff out of our garden and b because they poop everywhere so even though we clean up their poop sometimes like it just i'm like man my patio now has poop all over the place so we want to fence that off but all of that takes time money energy because also with the garden i really want to get to a place where i'm doing again what i did in nashville where i'm growing plants from seed but that also requires me to get some stuff in order in my house and once again it's like time and money and we're just moving forward one step at a time but that's where our heads are at someone asked what are your favorite pasta dishes okay my two favorite pasta dishes are as follows one cajun chicken pasta 
bomb.com. So good. The pioneer woman recipe is incredible. I change it a bit because I like put way more veggies in than she does because I just love my veggies. Um, but it's a really great recipe. And then also there's this recipe called saucy posse that Dan makes. It's like an Italian sausage, creamy kind of pasta. If I can find the recipe, I will link it down below. I think it might be a chef John food wishes recipe, but I'm not positive. Um, but that pasta recipe is also really good. Okay, someone asked, do you still do music? And the answer is, I mean, honestly, the answer is yes, but the answer is no in the sense that like, I obviously haven't recorded anything in a really long time. Goals would be for me to learn how to produce my own music because I love that I can produce my own video content, um, but I don't love that I can't produce my own music content. And I feel like I'm not like very many steps away from that in the sense that like, I used to edit music all of the time back in the day, um, like not just on GarageBand, but like on Pro Tools. Um, but one of the steps in going that direction, in my opinion, is understanding more about music theory. And so I have my piano back there, which is so amazing. It was given to us by a friend and my piano skills are legitimately improving all the time. So that's very exciting. I had set a random goal when I was pregnant to just keep something to keep me busy that by the end, by the time I delivered baby, I wanted to be able to do all of my scales, my major scales with both hands, da, 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 da all the way through with my eyes closed because I want to get comfortable enough with the piano to where it feels more like a language that I can speak and that I can really like play and I don't have to look and I can close my eyes or look around and I still know where I am. So I'm far from that. But as far as the scales go, I totally accomplished that mission by the end of my pregnancy. Um, so I have on the horizon some very specific songs that I'm actually looking to cover at some point and I've already discussed it with some friends up here. We'll see when that happens. I bet they think that I'm completely not planning on doing it anymore, but just things take me forever sometimes to actually make happen. So it is hopefully on the horizon. It's in my purview or whatever, and we will see. But every time someone asks, it always makes my heart warm. Oops, hit the mic. Because yeah, like I still, I love music. I mean, my dad is almost 70 and he still actively plays the guitar. He's like in incredible at the guitar and has a skill that I think I will have one day, but it has to be developed where, and the reason I think I'll have it is because I am like this with my voice and my memory, but I just don't have my instrumental skills like this, but he can hear any song and just immediately hop in and start playing and knows how to like go along with it. And that's what I want for myself on the piano. I want to know my way around well enough that I can just hear it and just start jumping in. Um, so yeah, someone asked, how long did you co-sleep with Logan and how did he do when you stopped? So everybody's got a different definition, I think, of what co-sleeping is. In some ways, we still co-sleep with him. And here's what I mean by that. We put him to sleep in his own bedroom, although he's just made another big transition. So for forever, we've always put him to sleep. Like we stay with him till he goes to sleep and then we leave. Um, but within like literally the last week, he's actually started putting himself to sleep. But every night, anywhere between 11 p.m. and like 3 a.m., he wakes up and he comes and climbs in bed with us. And we love that. We don't like plan on stopping that or telling him that he can't come in um, because it's the sweetest thing in the world to wake up next to our baby. And the years are flying by and we just know this isn't going to last very long. Like even going into this new chapter of him putting himself to sleep, in some ways it's like, well, it took long enough, like it's four and a half. And in other ways, it's like, oh man, that flew by. Like that chapter's done now. So um, yeah, I guess that's the end of that answer. I don't know. Okay. Someone said, genuine question reaction if growing if growing up your kids decide your values aren't theirs how would you go upon contradictions from humans you raised i'm a little confused but i think i get the gist of your question um and the we would just deal with it like we would still love them kind of going back to the very beginning there is something lovable within everyone so even if our children chose a completely different life and had completely different worldview like of course I'd be bummed. I would consider that a bummer. And in some ways, if I'm being honest, it would, I would kind of consider it a failure because I really believe the things I believe, but I can't control them. I don't want to control them. And 
God's got their own story for them. You know what I mean? And they're going to be on their own journey. And so if they ended up believing something different, it kind of just would be what it would be. And I would still see the things that I love about them and relate to them in that way. And it would be a lifelong conversation. That's the thing too, is people change a lot. People go through lots of shifts in their life. So like if my children saw things differently from me in like their twenties, I wouldn't necessarily be like, this is them for the rest of their lives. Like I would love them and be in relationship with them for who they are and the things that I love about them. I would keep praying for them. And I would also just be like, well, talk to me in a decade. Like, okay, talk to me in another decade. And you just kind of see because people change. People go on journeys that shape them and change them and give them different perspectives. Um, and I would just tell myself, like, you just ride it out, Nikki, and you just see what happens. And God has their own story for them. So I obviously make it sound easier because I'm not in the situation, but that's kind of what I think. Oh, this is good. Someone said, when you hear kids, uh, hear about unvaxxed kids passing away from quote unquote preventable diseases, does that ever scare you? Um, maybe in like my weakest moments of like, you know, when you can get fearful over anything in general, yeah, I mean, I'll get nervous, but there's so few and far between because I am so convinced of what I'm convinced about. And also I believe, oh, so grandma had to bring baby back because she's uh, heading out of the house. So I got to wrap this up. But to end that sentence, I believe I have a friend on here who makes YouTube videos named Todd Herman. He's a like political commentator and lives up in our area. And he calls it the Mockingbird Media because he's referring to Project Mockingbird that the CIA ran, where basically it's it's the general idea, concept, provable fact is that the CIA was, and in my opinion, potentially still is running the media. So I believe very much so that the media is like paid for and bought and it has a very specific agenda that is directed by the government in a lot of ways. And so a lot of it, I don't even necessarily believe. Also, the problem with all this hyper connection is you hear and see the worst of the worst. So there's kind of this combo of like, mm, I don't believe you. And there's a lot of situations where like, once you dive in deeper, you end up finding out like, wait a minute, that story wasn't even true. Like at face value, it sounded like one thing. And then you went in and then you find out, wait a minute, they were vaxxed. Or, you know, there was like that story of that ship outside of Washington, I think it was, where they had an outbreak of, I want to say it was the measles, but everyone had been vaxxed. So it's very interesting just when you really dig into those stories, in my opinion, you end up finding out that the story is different than how it was presented. Kind of similarly, similar like along the same lines as like midwives being crucified in the media. I think that's very purposeful. The Midwives Association was actually just acquired by like the Nurses Association of America or something like that. I'm not saying the proper titles because I'm just sitting here with no notes holding my baby. Just remember all of this is just like we're friends talking. That's what you all have to remember. Um, but I always just think, what about all the deaths that take place in hospitals? Because those are not talked about or put in front of the media in the same way that accidents are with midwives, in my opinion and from my research. So I actually kind of could just keep going, but we're gonna wrap it up now. My mom just walked in actually with the baby swing and uh, she's feeling a little antsy, so I'm gonna roll. But I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I look forward to reading your comments and I will, God willing, see you guys back here soon with another new video. Okay, say bye baby. Can you say bye? Look how cute she is. Oh, my baby. Okay.